Yeah, I see Kiki and, and Eric. Uh, hey. Hey. Um, so you're almost our last speaker, actually. So I, it's going very fast. And I have to say, I was. Uh, it's been very dense and we've seen a lot of things already. Um, I think your production, so we had uh, two young PhD uh, people this, uh, this afternoon. And I think what you're about to present, you're also close to this uh, whole scene of uh, research. And um, I'm going to read what, what, what I wrote down, of course. Um, I think you both did the ITEC, so this double yes. room with Professor Knippers and Professor Menges, which we've seen uh, earlier this week. And so you have your own office, which is called Some People. Yeah. It's a difficult title somehow. <laughs> and um, I think, Eric, Eric, you're an associate at SHOP uh, at the moment still, uh, next to your own practice. And um, uh, I think, Kiki, you're uh, an assistant or a visiting professor at Carnegie Mellon School of Architecture. Yeah. And your practice, as we told before, is based in New York. And so I'm about to discover. I've checked a little bit, and so my colleagues were very full of your work. So um, I think for our students and for the wider audience, this is quite a special thing. So thanks, and the platform is all yours. I will try to let the screen over to you. Hang on. Yes. So I need to switch this. Um, yeah, should be working now. Yes. Yeah, be about. here. Okay. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Okay, cool. Let's shut down my mic. And... Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for the invitation too. It's it's really exciting to be here um, with a, such a group, such a great group of speakers. Um, so today we're going to present, um, you know, uh, a kind of background on a few projects related to wood, um, and we're going to start with some of the academic uh, work that we did in, in the University of Stuttgart. Um, and then we're gonna talk more about our, our practice work, um, which you know has derived a lot of ideas from, from that kind of uh, research-based work. Um, so the, the presentation is divided in those kind of two parts. Um, you know, one is more research academic based and one is a little bit more practice oriented. Um, yeah, and I guess because of the kind of technical um, the technical background of the of the workshops and everything, we thought it'd be interesting for everyone to see the kind of development um, of some of these projects in relation to to wood bending, to elastic bending in wood, and um, and also in robotic sewing. So I'm going to start by showing. I know Professor Menges talked about this earlier um, earlier this week, but I'm going to just refresh a little bit about the pavilion. Um, 2015-16, and then I will talk about some spin-off research um, that we did at the University of Stuttgart after that um, that was very related to this. Um, it's kind of the same line of research. Um, so as you know, the pavilions are a kind of um, a student group-led um, project that is um, also led by the ITK and ICD from Mengus and Knippers. Um, together with a group of, of PhD researchers and sometimes also other um, collaborating universities. Um, so I know you guys saw this before, but I, I just really want to touch on a few things, um, on two, two ideas that were pretty important for us um, when we did this pavilion, which one was the idea of, of elastic bending of, of thin materials, of thin wood. Um, and, it, and the other one was uh, the robotic sewing technique, which is um, very closely related to, to uh, the use of thin materials. Um, so for, you know, for elastic bending, the idea that was uh, developed for this was um, the kind of differential buildup of the segments that would allow for curvature by adapting the stiffness level um, 
of each of the segments. Um, and that kind of stiffness variation was uh, translated into a buildup of um, different orientations of, of veneer, which was, you know, formed um, custom form to, to make each of the curvatures of, of the segments of the pavilion. Um, and then the second idea that was developed here was the kind of robotic sewing, um, which was based um, on using a, a industrial sewing machine that's used for, for leather typically. Um, and then of course, how that would relate to a robotic setup. So in this case, we developed the setup with a, an external axis, which was the machine. Um, and then, you know, in the workspace, we kind of had an assembly area on the left that you can see, and then on the right side was the sewing. So each of the segments was brought to the sewing machine before, um, after being pre-assembled with a, a custom jig that would hold it in place. Um, and then once, uh, once that happened, the segment would be brought to the sewing machine where it would be held in place. Um, and then the glue that was applied before would, would dry up and, you know, it would end up being this piece. And at the same time, that's where we embedded that, uh, white strip that you see there, which acted as a kind of, uh, fibrous connection, um, that resisted tension, um, and work interacted with the kind of shear resisting connection of the finger joints. Okay, um, so yeah, ultimately, I mean, this was uh, kind of our, our first exposure and, and research into into these ideas, um, which uh, resulted in this in this pavilion and. Um, you know, it, it continued into into our, our thesis uh, research, which um, I developed with my thesis partner, Martin, um, back in, uh, what was it, 17, 16, 17. Um, and basically what we were looking at was, um, you know, a lot of thinking back coming from that pavilion and thinking about, um, you know, what we could do with, the, with, with wood. Um, and we kind of divided it would end sewing and we kind of divided our research into four parts. So um, we were thinking about textile patterning. We were thinking about wood forming, um, elastic bending of wood. Um, we were thinking about sewing wood and we were thinking about robotics. Um, so, you know, we, we started with this kind of idea of patterning, which we saw as a, obviously it's a, you know, a millinery technique um, and it's the basic way that the clothing is formed. Um, and the adjustability of these patterns as it relates to three-dimensional structures was really, really interesting to us. So, you know, we still saw that even though it's such an old technique, there's still a lot of room for, um, for innovation and improvement. Uh, and then, of course, like these kind of ideas are also present in, in, in wood. Um, I think one of the greatest examples is the work of, of Ray and Charles Eames with their um, kind of plywood chairs and even their wood, their wood stint, um, which kind of also, you know, was the same kind of idea that you start from a flat piece and then that was pressure formed into this plywood, um, which resulted in very lightweight and um, resistant elements. Um, and then, you know, thinking about this idea of patterning also in a larger scale and how it's, it's been experimented with um, in terms of elastic bending and, you know, previous projects that ICD and uh, MTech have done, um, and even, you know, installations, there's this installation in New York that, we, that we've looked at. Um, and even going back to Buck Buckminster Fuller's Ply Dome, which is one of, I think, one of the earliest examples of this kind of um, elastic bending to create a, of a piece of wood to create a, a three-dimensional structure. So, you know, this, the idea of the thinness brought back um, uh, the, the relevance of the thread and stitch connection. Um, which we'll talk about a little bit er later. And then, you know, the kind of last part of this was the robotics um, research and the, the kind of idea that if you, em by embedding more sensors uh, into a robot, you can give it a bit more um, understanding of the material and its position relative to what it's constructing. Um, and what this could, this could mean in when we were designing things that were like elastically bent and also, you know, complex geometries. So for the textile techniques, we kind of started with this, these series of techniques that are, um, you know, 
traditional from a from a very old book um, and we thought about how we could make them into harder materials so we started by making all these paper models and the idea was that then we would translate those models into into plywood um, so you know by kind of trying to mimic these um, patterning techniques that are meant for textiles in paper we were able to to get different kinds of um, of curvatures for example like synclastic curvature anticlastic curvature um, and even like, you know, compound curvature with, with layered systems, like uh, this thing that's called flounces, or even like kind of spinning a system with, with, with some pleating. But, you know, uh, with this uh, development, we were able to find some tectonic systems that would, would influence the way we would um, start to think about our later development in the, in the demonstrator. Um, you know, and then, of course, when we started to think about doing this in wood, we had to consider the bending of the wood. So we chose a very flexible, um, a very flexible species, which is um, the European beech. And we, we tested the, its maximum bending capacity um, in, in kind of different proportions of, of wood samples and derived a formula that yielded the maximum bending height in relation to the, to the length of the piece. Um, and we use this as a kind of parametric value check in our digital model that no piece was over its maximum bending capacity. Um, but I should clarify, this was only plywood. It wasn't done with the kind of differentiating, differentiated lamination that the, the previous project was done with. Um, and then we, we also thought a little bit more about what it meant to sew a piece of wood and, and what happens to that piece of wood when you look at it very closely. Um, so if you look at, um, this is a, a piece of veneer before and after it's punctured. Um, so what starts to happen is like a lot of the fibers, some fibers are broken, of course, because you're, you're impacting the material, but a lot of the fibers also spread apart. Um, and the hole is, is, that's left by the needle is very, very small. So we wanted to understand the potential of this for thin materials um, as a connection, uh, as a mechanical connection. So we tested that against um, bolted connections um, with, uh, I think they were M M6 bolts, um, and understood that, you know, there were some places of overlap where we were able to, um, where we were able to kind of have the same performance as bolts, um, but we saw that the fractures would be more distributed, um, and then, you know, the connection would also be able to stretch before failing. So, you know, given the correct distribution of the sewing stitches, you could start to mimic the strength of the bolting. Um, and then the last part was the robotic sewing, which we developed as a, as a, as an, as a thought after the pavilion using the same sewing machine. So the pavilion is kind of on the left. Um, so the, uh, sewing machine is an external axis. And what we thought about is mounting the machine onto the robot, which, um, increased our fabrication envelope because we, it was easier to sew larger pieces because you're moving the machine instead of the piece. Um, and this also allows you to kind of add additively to, to a piece that you're constructing and build around it. Um, so that's kind of the comparison of the, 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 uh, the workspace for the pavilion, which was the kind of um, segments, and then the workspace for, for this project, which is um, mounted on the robot. So you're working, you're, you're moving the robot around the piece. Um, and to do that, we had to, to incorporate um, some sensing technology into the effector. So we had a webcam, um, which you can see you can see here, and a distance sensor, which you could see here, um, that was meant to read a, a, a pre-drawn mark on the wood and guide the sewing machine on that mark. Um, and of course, this required some integration into the robotic system by setting up a client and server computer to send this information back and forth. But what it allowed us to do is that the coding on the robot was actually extremely minimal. Minimal. It was mostly kind of listening for the signals, and everything was happening on the client end as a reaction to what it was reading from the uh, from the camera. So as it was looking at the at the red line, it was able to say like understand where the robot was and tell it where to go next. And that coupled with the sewing was how we were able to to kind of sew these pieces together. Um, yeah, this is just another view of the of the client. So you can see here some of the the video feed that we were getting from the so from the webcam, and then how that is translated into a vector to kind of move the um, the machine to the next point. Um, so to begin to do that, the first step was to kind of 
um, scan, scan the piece with a connect that we had mounted at the bottom of this. And the idea was that we would use a mesh to bring the, the, bring the sewing machine to the first place of sewing. And then once it was in that position, oh, sorry. I'll just try to scrub here. Yeah, once it was in the first position, um, the sewing machine would start would start sewing along along the red line, which is sorry, I'm repeating this, but you'll see. So yeah, here we go. So that's that's the video feed from the camera. Um, it's kind of translating that into a direction, and the the distance sensor is attempting to move the the sewing machine up and down to adapt to the position three dimensionally of the piece. Um, so that was kind of the the development of that, and like you know, not all the sewing points were perfect, but we were able to calibrate some so that it actually started to follow the red line much better. Um, and lastly, very quickly, just the the kind of tectonic system that we that we ended up deriving for the demonstrator I'll show after this was of of course considering the the workspace of the sewing machine, which is limited by this box that is hanging from. So you know, we were able to understand that there were certain geometries that we could um, adapt to, to sew, to bring the machine and sew as far deep into a structure as possible. And that was also coupled with the ideas that we presented at the beginning of these textile techniques to create the anticlastic and synclastic curvature um, to start to mimic a kind of base or design surface. And then there are like kind of these more architectural points where we were able to create more um, some apertures that you see more on the left and some areas of more strengthening um, that we added onto the edges of the, of the pavilion. So, just, you know, looking at the whole process of this overall, um, I'll run through an example of how, how we constructed this. Um, oh, sorry. So the first part is like we define a, a design surface based on the maximum reach of the robot. Um, and that was then populated with a, um, uh, a series of segments, which was also considering the length of the arm of the sewing machine is calibrated to that. Um, and those segments were meant to bend against each other and sewn together, be sewn together. And, um, and then that would keep this kind of geometry in place and form the, the, the design geometry. Um, oh, sorry. So, okay, so looking at the kind of fabrication process, the first part was to sew, to mark the pieces of wood where we would be sewing them. So we did this with this red marker. Um, then in the same position, we would mill out the kind of sheets um, and, and specific geometries for these segments. Um, and then we would have to uh, kind of attach these segments temporarily using um, a few bolts um, to bring the machine into place for the sewing. And then once it was sewn, the bolts would be taken out. Um, so like we saw earlier, the first part was to kind of scan scan the current status of the piece as it was constructed. Um, and then we would bring the machine into the first position. Um, that's what you see here. So the kind of sewing machine is entering entering the piece here and reaching the first, first point where the red line begins. Um, and then once we get there, we're able to um, start the sewing process where the webcam is following the sewing, the red line and sewing the pieces together. And then that would happen subsequently on each of the connections so that we would start to build the structure. Uh, you can see the plywood is wet because it's actually became pretty stiff when it was dry. So there were issues uh, sometimes with, with that stiffness um, and the needles. So we were having to wet the, the plywood in some instances to, to make it safer. Um, yeah, and then what this whole thing allowed us to do is like when we were constructing it, we were able to move the piece around and bring the sewing machine to a different place to sew this complex geometry together. Um, and in the end, we we did four kind of segments that uh, were easier to assemble, which we then put together um, to exhibit the piece. So this is the final piece that was resulting from that. Um, it was it was it's about um, four meters long and. Um, and weighs about 60 kilograms, um, so it's it's pretty it's it's pretty light, um, and the material thickness ranges from three to six millimeters. Um, and as you can see, you know this is kind of a result of an integrated uh, design process where we considered a lot of fabrication constraints and also developed a kind of novel tectonic system based or inspired on these textile techniques. Um, and that position of translation is something that really fascinated us and and um, 
and really influenced our work afterwards. Um, yeah, so these are just some North shots. That's kind of a close up of one of the edges that was sewn. Um, and then I think uh, Professor Meng has also touched on this. This research was then taken into this next project, which was an exhibition in Shanghai, um, which my thesis partner developed with the ICD. Um, I'm not going to talk about it today. I just wanted to mention that that was the kind of next part of this of this research, which is very similar um, line of thinking in terms of uh, bending and sewing. Um, so yeah, after these two academic projects, um, we're going to go through some projects uh, from our design practice. Um, I hope you will see a little bit of the influence from the from our research or our previous years at um, the University of Stuttgart and how we've tried to continue that some of that thinking into our into our practice. So I'll look Kiki for that. Yes. So, um, so yeah, in, in our practice, it's kind of like a research oriented practice. And we try to keep on exploring this kind of like advanced digital, to digital tools, such like robotics, VR user interfaces and see now how can, how can we achieve a bit more than material performance? Like, can we um, move towards a more like human centered, um, socioeconomically sustainable architecture that we can start addressing issues of like human experience and social agency. Um, so we work on public art installations, exhibitions and workshops, and we investigate, investigate this kind of like innovative ways to broaden the use of these technologies and see how we can use them not only um, for material and structural efficiency, but integrating all of that knowledge that we have now trying to start engaging the public and uh, encouraging inter interaction. Uh, so in our practice, we kind of have these kind of three main cores of our work, uh, technology, materiality, and human agency. And when these cores start interacting with each other, uh, we create what we call uh, fields of action, um, which is uh, intuitive making process, collaborative fabrication systems, and democratization of technology. Uh, for every project that we get, we try to see if there is kind of an opportunity to innovate in these fields using some of the tools uh, that we have in different combinations. So we have this kind of like coding systems that help us navigate through our work and kind of like evaluate the projects that we get under kind of like this larger scope and umbrella of our practice. And in this presentation, we will show you uh, one project from each field of action, and we're going to focus to the ones that deal with timber, with, that we think they're going to be more relevant for you. And two of them are going to be workshop based, so we think it's going to be like um, even more relevant to what you're doing right now. Um, so we will start uh, with this kind of like intuitive making process uh, as a field of action, and we're going to present you a workshop that we did um, in Bangkok in uh, Chulalongkorn University. And in this workshop, we work with students to explore the design space uh, of bent plywood even further. And we did that through the int intuitive making of physical models and prototypes. Um, so we know how complex it is to model and simulate this material system. And we decided to explore um, its design potential using low tech and um, analog tools this time, aiming to develop a more intuitive understanding through craftsmanship. So the students worked to develop a series of paper models in the beginning that investigated the design potential of the material system. Of course, they had like less material restrictions in paper than they would in wood, uh, but this gave them the freedom to start developing kind of like intuitive forms that uh, emerge just by bending a material and fixing it in place. Um, these forms challenged the technique and brought it to its limits. And uh, they created this kind of like porous structures that consist of components that have even like super thin areas that are extremely bent. Um, and they introduced cuts that allowed the material to bend. And also these cuts kind of like guided the geometry formation of each component. At the same time, when they after like um, spending like a, a day of like paper, uh, working on paper models, they started developing um, the act, uh, working with the actual material, uh, which was a three millimeter, three ply plywood. And they started testing their design in one to one scale. Uh, the pieces were cut in CNC 2D and they were just bent and fixed manually in place. This process revealed the material limitations of plywood, such as the relationship between the width of the pieces and the maximum bending radius, for example. And there, there was this kind of like back and forth process that help the students adjust their designs from paper back to one-to-one -to -one scale. And it kind of led to a more, more informed design decisions that took into account the material properties and everything that they learned using their own hands. 
So by understanding these properties intuitively, we collectively designed um, a wall prototype that consists of three layers of components that are bent and locked in place. All of the design of the components had a starting point, the paper models that we showed before, it was adjusting according to what we learned through the manual physical testing. Uh, so there were three types of components, one for each layer, and they were all layered on top of each other. And this multi-layer design helped us kind of like stiffen the structure, but also lock the curved form of the wall in place. Um, in general, for us, exploring manually the design space of the material systems that we're working with, it's a very important part of our work uh, because it helps us quickly move through several iterations and develop efficiently like more informed designs that take into account the material properties, especially when working with complex systems that require intense simulations and 3D modeling in order to have some accurate results. Developing kind of an intuitive understanding of the material becomes a vital part of the design process. Um, the craft machine that, that emerges out of these tests, if we combine them now with advanced technologies such as robotics, it can lead to kind of like more holistic um, proposals and uh, even more unexpected designs, I would say, that wouldn't have been predicted before necessarily. So this takes us to the second field of action that focuses on the development of uh, robotic systems, collaborative fabrication systems. Um, and we will show you um, this, 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 this project that is also part of a workshop for um, uh, AAG, the Advanced Architecture Geometry Conference. And what we try to do here is that we develop kind of like a collaborative robotic, robotic fabrication process for assembling wooden structures without the use of any scaffolding. So we use two Kuka Agilus robotic arms to assemble wood shingles in an additive way. Um, in our process, oh, I didn't know this is a <laughs> so, um, In this process, one robot picks up the shingle, it breaks it in place and staples it while um, the second one provides support uh, during the fixing process. Um, and you can see now in action, like the first one picks up the shingle, uses the pneumatic gripper to staple, and then the second one moves in place and um, offers support while the first one is... Um, is basically stapling it. <laughs> okay, thanks. So yeah, here's just a close up of this uh, stapling process. Um, you can see how the pneumatic gripper is being activated. Um, so one robot has an active effector in this case that is um, uh, that is being pneumatically actuated, and the other one has a simple passive effector. It's basically two pieces of plywood together that acts. Um, this effector is kind of like a moving scaffold um, throughout the process of stapling. So the, the development of the active um, end effector was kind of like a challenging part because um, these smaller KUKAs have a small payload, which means they can carry up to maximum 10 kilos. So the effector had to be lightweight, but also robust. So we got like an off-the-shelf pneumatic stable GAN and we mounted on the flange and we created kind of an effector that consists of this stable GAN and also a suction cap that um, acts as a pneumatic gripper in order for us to be able to pick up the pieces. Um, the collaborative workflow of this process of this project just allowed us to have minimal scaffolding, uh, which made the structure more material efficient. Uh, and so the use of the second robot um, actually helped us avoid having any extra material for support during construction. We see this kind of like collaborative fabrication processes. Um, we see that they have allowed us to expand kind of like the design space of robotic manufacturing, but on, not only by expanding um, the physical working space, but also uh, by providing flexibility to develop more advanced and custom and sustainable fabrication techniques. And this possibility is increased even more uh, when we develop processes that give more active roles to human builders. Um, so in our last projects, uh, in, in the last project that we're going to show you today, we proposed kind of like a human robot collaborative process, um, investigating ways of opening up uh, the fabrication process to the public. And it was kind of like an effort to demo democratize technology and demystify the use of all these tools and making them more accessible to the public. 
So we developed this project when selected as uh, finalists by the Tallinn Architecture Biennale for their um, installation competition. It's kind of like um, a competition that speculates about the future of design and manufacturing. Uh, and our proposal was a timber structure that emerges from in situ uh, human robot collaboration. So the topic of the competition was primitive hat, and we explored um, how the geological, human, and industrial evolution, as you can see in this diagram, kind of like brought us to what we call today the Anthropocene and Industry 4.0. And we investigated the transformation of uh, the primitive hat to what we call the post-digital hat um, in regards to the materials, technologies, and all the dwelling concepts, um, and try to conclude to an architectural strategy for that project. So in our proposal, um, we have local and vernacular materials used, and we try to create this kind of like adaptable tectonic system um, that we put together uh, through an intuitive in situ uh, collaborative fabrication and assembly process. Uh, we proposed a live showcase during the Biennale to show the potential of democratizing and demystifying the use of these technologies and the importance of human participation when we construct public spaces. So the system questions the basic typologies of wood construction, like surface versus frame tectonics, and we created kind of a scheme that acts both as facade and structure. It takes advantage of four um, of different kinds of like manufactured uh, wood types. Uh, we have linear lumber, four by four beams that achieve the double curved complexity of the truss system. Um, and we have the three, um, three millimeter beach plywood sheets um, that form the bent enclosure panels and are attached on top of the beams. So the space truss is fabricated with five axis milling of the complex 3D joinery that I will show you in a bit. And this allows us to build these doubly curved surfaces. Um, it's kind of like toroidal, uh, toroid structure that um, we propose. And the curvature of the exterior panels is achieved through manual bending. So a human robot, robot collaborative process is employed to take advantage of the precision and speed of this uh, machining complex joinery. And then we have the human cognition and intuition that are used to assemble and manipulate the trusses and bent panels. This is the robotic setup. You can really like left to right. Um, the robot picks up the strat, mills the joint um, using a bandsaw and brings it in place for assembly by humans. And here's the, the, the joint that I, that I talked about before. You can see like that it's kind of complex and it was pretty critical for us to have of kind of like a robotic milling process for that part. And then you can also see how um, the bent panels are fixed uh, manually uh, on the wood beams afterwards. So because of the specific scope and timeline of that project, we propose that most of the radial segments of the toroid are prefabricated off-site and then transferred and assembled on-site. And the last parts of the pavilion would be fabricated on-site with the assistance of visitors. Um, so here's like a physical model of the proposal. Um, you see there is like a toroidal structure that reveals its material and fabrication process kind of like gradually as it's being approached by visitors. The outside ridge is a solid bubbly structure and it starts revealing itself as you go inside into a densely populated um, curved timber lattice. Um, so when you enter inside, the visitors can witness and participate in this kind of like advanced robotic fabrication process. And the goal is to show kind of like the importance of human participation and engagement uh, in the construction of public structures and also try to demystify the use of um, robotics in architectural design and construction. Um, yes, yeah, so this was the last project. Uh, we gave you kind of like an overview of our work, both in academia and in practice. We kind of like really like working with Timber and also like speculating about innovative ways of integrating um, this material system in our designs. And we hope that this presentation gave you some ideas of the wide range of possibilities uh, that exist when working with bent plywood and the different ways of approaching the topic. Um, yeah, thank you. If you have any questions, we're, we're happy to talk about it. Uh, wait, hang on. I'm trying to put my camera. Yeah, I think it should be fine. Yeah. Oh, wow. Bravo. Nice, uh, nice lecture. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit astonishing how it's 
the things that you described are exactly the things that we're trying to do this week with the students. So I, I guess you know it more or less. So that's it's like kicking a, a kicking in a, an open door somehow. Uh, right. So it's fantastic. The, the the way is the the fact is that of course due to this crisis that we can't really do so much uh, with real constructing in there. There's a real issue there. Um, so we're probably going to repeat this one, actually the same team with the scripts that we are writing in Caramba and Octopus next year. And I hope uh, I could invite you then actually to, to join us on that. I mean, it should be... Yeah, amazing. it would be great. Yeah. I mean, we're all trying to, to adjust and adapt to this <laughs> not physical work anymore. Um, it's, yeah, for, for us, it was a challenge to... Um, trying to bring everything digital now and also in terms of teaching it's uh, it was an important part like the physical work and uh, it was it was a critical part now we're adjusting it for a bit but hopefully we're gonna get back into it yeah the the fact is i i, I mean maybe uh, we're gonna go through the questions uh, quite soon but just yeah. to share that information with you it's uh, with my students at the at the ucl in, in london too we had a similar problem in a way that everything had to become digital, but the, the, the good stuff was that we started the first five weeks already to work and fabricate things in the workshop, which means that they had a little bit of prior knowledge before to go into the lockdown and then to work out things from there on then to become more digital, which works. But if you start a construction, construction workshop in total lockdown, there's a lack of the start, there's a lack of, it's really quite quite complex. And I was really amazed by my students at, uh, at the Bartlett in, in uh, London, first year students, uh, MNG, and they uh, learned themselves completely by their own. In two weeks' time, they knew uh, Fusion 360 made pavilions moving and all this. So it has some advantages, but um, I have to say it's, it's a challenge at the moment. So. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to repeat this workshop and I think this, this free knowledge already is a very good thing that previously we haven't done it, that we share so many with so many people and teachers uh, things that we are doing. So, and what is very special on your work, so I'm, I'm very happy that you presented this because we started off with Achim, of course, has a global approach to his work and what he has been doing the last 20 years. And so it's it's very broad and he's asking a lot of questions to the audience and we're slowly getting after two days of lectures where a lot of people threw out questions at us we're also today we're getting some answers it's you're showing in detail also how it exactly worked where you come from with with the ids and all this and this afternoon actually too with two phd uh, people um they showed in that I, I'm, I'm not sure if you've seen it but uh, they showed more or less in depth what they had been developing. And I think you know the work of Lotta, of course. So that's, yeah. um, uh, that was very, very special. And I think for, for students at this point, uh, where they should be in our workshop, this is very good to see like how it comes from the digital, from making smaller mock-ups with the paper, how this becomes physical. And of course, I mean, at the moment we're developing for them the scripts in uh, Caramba uh, to calculate it, which is because that would be one of my questions. I think you worked a lot with Sophistic, but I would I would be interested to see how you how you do the calculation stuff and how much it influences um, your work. Because you do you could do the experimental form finding by working on material and then feeding it back into a computer and just doing it geometrically bound beyond actually just a mere calculation and finding it like that. Of course, our engineering approach would be more to do the form finding process and then. So work it in. Right. So that I, that's one of my questions. But I'm, I'm maybe going to leave the people that uh, listen to it also. Um, so I don't know if you have access to the to the chat room. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. We see. Yeah. We can answer your question first, or or yeah, start sure. with. Yeah, and maybe if you have, yeah, let's let's go to that question first. I mean, I, I so so we're not we're not engineers, so the. Um, the approach is always almost always pretty empirical. Um, so like, for example, in the first project that we talked about the it was actually just seeing how much the wood would bend and understanding what that radius was. And then when we were modeling it, 
making sure that the modeled radius or the target geometry was not beyond that. It's it's actually not very complicated. At, at some point, we had assistance for that project for Sophistic. Um, and at, at a point where it wasn't really what we presented. And um, it was great, but it also required a whole... A, a, a big investment to get it to, to start to do the things that we wanted. So we generally stick to, to very um, kind of like intuitive and empirical um, testing to derive the, the, the understanding of the material, especially because like even the plywood batches between themselves might vary. Like the project on the screen. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? I mean, it was it was crazy to see like how different because we had worked with the same material before, but it was crazy to see how different it was the one that we got there. Um, they were, you know, patches, um, and it would break in weird situations. like the um, the quality of the wood was like so low that we would have failures in, in parts that we would never expect. Um, so it had a completely different uh, performance than the actual material that we've worked, the same material we worked before. So it was interesting to see, like, you know, from different sources, you get different material, and then, you know, everything kind of, like, falls apart. And it was, we were, like, lucky enough that it was, we had planned that it would work, that we would design it there, the actual pavilion, like, the actual system. And we didn't pre-design before because I don't think we would have actually been able to simulate this weird material that we got there. Uh, but like for example, for the last one, um, we we came we started we started more like with the fabrication process. We thought about this kind of like truss system that has bent panels on top attached, and then uh, in discussions with um, uh, engineers, like kind of like you know friends that we know that they they have the tools and they can test things for us. They would just like run some simple caramba test just to make sure everything stands and kind of like make sure we, we work also like with kind of like more rational geometry so it was kind of like this tor toroid so that we knew that it's something that we can handle and we can control so then we'd have like yeah our, our engineer friends like running a quick test in caramba you know telling us if there are things that we should uh tweak and change and then we would kind of like rationalize it even more and there would be like this kind of like back and forth uh but we didn't we didn't start with a simulation, like we started more with a fabrication concept and setup in our mind or like how this can happen there in that place. And then, um, yeah, just uh, have some back and forth discussions and very quick tests in, um, in Caramba. Cool. Um, shall, we, shall we have a look at, uh, at, at some yeah. of the other questions? Yeah, sure. I think the first one is talking about the fabric in the membrane that you used and um, um, how, how it compares to with or without the fabric? Um, so the actual fabric membrane, I, I don't remember the name, but it was like um, a high grade like tarp um, that was um, highly resistant to tension. So it wasn't stretching at all. Um, I think that's the first part of the question. And how did this compare to the mechanical connection without the fabric? Well, uh, without the fabric, we only had the finger joints together so it's very easy for the thing to fall apart because um, it wasn't designed as a compression only structure and it and also there was shear so the actual fabric pushed the finger joints to their limit and and when we kind of tied them together that held them in place um, and also resists obviously tension that, that the finger joints come out so that was that was kind of key in that project um, and the sewing thread material was this something you had to play with Oh, the sewing thread. Um, no, I think the the sewing threads um, that are available, the string that's available at a certain thickness is usually extremely strong. Like it's just uh, an easily available nylon has a lot of strength. Um, so, and especially when you think about distributing it along a whole seam, it, that wasn't really an issue. So I hope that answers your questions, uh, Sergio. Sergio. Um, you want to take the next one? Can we read it? It's about the accuracy of the robot within without the feedback loop. I think it's pretty oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I guess that's so the feedback loop within the f accuracy of the robot within without the feedback loop. Um, the accuracy of the robot is kind of determined by the robot itself. Uh, I would say. 
So it's always going to move in the same type of accuracy. The inaccuracy came in the kind of latency of the system. So it took a while to take an image from the webcam and translate it into a position. Um, and sometimes that delay would make us realize that it, the robot was actually going in the wrong direction and we had to apply a correction to that. And that was kind of a calibration um, calibration process that we had to go through. Um, in the other project that I that I didn't talk about that Professor Menges um, presented, the, the other Sun Pavilion in China, I believe that was resolved in a in a simpler way. That instead of having a live feed, it was it was a photograph of that position, and then the robot would do all the stitching based on that position, as opposed to updating every stitch. So at each of the patch joints, it would it would kind of sew that entire thing based on the four indicators that were on that piece. Um, so yeah. Um, how much is the percentage of material loss due to errors, building accidents, drawing and precisions? What are the most difficult challenges of digital fabrication with wood? Oh. Yeah, material loss. That's, uh, that's an issue actually. That's a, a great question because there is material loss. And when we're talking about, you know, um, intuitive, Intu intuition in making and you know use your hands in order to like you know start understanding the material um we should always be thinking about the waste that we produce we always try to prototype with things that can actually be kept and you know um used uh, uh later in the pavilion like as, as actual components but um i think that's also something that we should think about like with which kind of materials do we prototype so Paper models, it can be a good direction for like testing something fast. Of course, everything that is digital, it's great. Like we can we can start testing everything and be more, uh, have some more information be before we start and we start wasting material. Uh, but when we start actually working with the, um, uh, in one-to-one -one with the actual material, it's, I think it's always important to think about, you know, um, to plan these tests and plan the prototypes and always have kind of like a, a methodology and a strategy and like, what are you going to, what do you want to get out of it? Uh, even if it's intuitive, you have to have kind of like a strategy in your mind and understand what you're testing, putting your things down and um, kind of like, you know, understand what kind of results you're expecting expecting out of it and uh, try to organize everything around it. So like, you know where you want to go and you just kind of like systematize all of your tests and experiments so that you, um, you try to get the answers that you want. You're just not playing with material that's going to be actual like waste um, later. But it's true that there is there is waste and um, working also we have worked with other kinds of materials like plastics and, 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 and carbon fiber. And um, that's even more um, shocking to see the waste that comes out of it than in wood. But um, I think we should always be trying to, to limit that as much as we can just by planning and systematize our work as much as possible. Uh, um, I think the challenge is that you work with the wood because that's the second part of the question. It's because they're principally they're the same as you work with general in general timber, I would say, right? But it's uh, that's I don't know what your answer would be, but I, I see digital fabrication as rather timber is already so digitized. Actually, I mean everybody is using a lot of tools to work with timber, so I don't know if it's actually. If, it has been digital since the last 50 years, probably, because the sewing and, and how they cut and chop off wood is already completely robotized, uh, yeah. with robot, uh, robotics. Yeah. Uh, it's now in the end phase where the nodes and the, the machining maybe is a little bit more precise and can be customized, but I think it was, it was more an industrial process, but, which has now been customized, but it has always been a bit similar. But of course, you're using the coding to your advantage which means that all of a sudden, instead of standing on the workflow and telling to someone to chop the piece in somehow the way you want to have it, you guys take over the process and you engage in a totally different way with the makers, which I think is instead of the, the, the general challenge is maybe like, how do you feel like makers or architects? Yeah. Yeah, that's just the exciting part of these processes that the you know, that we can get into that world um, and, and kind of participate and even sometimes guide that process. Um, that's definitely a really exciting part of that for us. Yeah. Um, 
There's Boshang asking for your take on banded plywood in architectural elements such as flooring structure or seismic wall. Yeah, limitations. Yeah, many limitations, and I think it's um, uh, it really depends on the on the kind of of course plywood you're using. But um, you know, thinking about uh, waterproofing and exterior use of this um, of this of this material, it's, it's pretty important for us. It's always. Um, you know, something we need to think about, like even if it's just, um, you know, a temporary installation that is going to be outside, um, how it's going to react to a heavy rain or a heavy wind, um, that's always an issue. So when we're talking about architectural elements, there's so many more restrictions. I think there is a, I'm not sure about like bent plywood, but in general about, you know, like kind of like um, automating timber construction for architectural elements. There's been like extensive research um, and it's it's getting there and it's actually happening, but about bend plywood specifically, I think it's a really, really uh, challenging. It's a new thing. And when it comes to like, I think as a hybrid system, it, it has a lot of potential, but um, it, there, there, there's, there's certainly like a lot of, li of limitations instead of like, uh, yeah, structural performance and also like weatherproofing. Well, I think for, for the seismic design, it's also interesting maybe for, it's, it's of course, it's a lightweight material, right? I mean, it's a lot more, it has a lot less weight to carry than other materials, which is, of course, of a big advantage. And what is specific in your projects is normally with the joints are always quite complex. Uh, in timber, that they are, they are usually a lot of, uh, uh, showing a lot of steel uh, elements, which are, then having a certain, a certain ductility, of course. But in your case, you're trying to go around it, which we saw also in the lectures this afternoon. People are searching for finger joints, but then with fabric, and like, it's very hands-on and trying to find other ways of solving details with, uh, with the plywood, which I think there, there's definitely a chance to develop that much further also uh, in structural systems. And then there's, there's a question from Kritika, um, which is quite interesting because it's true. I mean, we've seen a lot of pavilions uh, that were presented, of course, and then it's always a question, uh, okay, how do we get this to the real world? And even on these pavilions, yeah, what do you do with the pavilion afterwards? What is the afterlife? What is, um, how does it, is it treated, uh, the timber? Is it, how is it performing under um, wind and uh, humidity and I think that's quite an interesting question. What's the afterlife? That's actually a really great point. I think this is one of the challenges uh, of of using thin plywood because um, it can degrade really quickly. I mean, typically these structures uh, would not really last under under rain, um, and we weren't expecting them. The smaller ones. Um, the first the the first pavilion was outside, and that was. Um, treated and sealed um but the lifespan was also not as um perhaps not as long as we would have uh we would have ex expected um because the sealants um don't always work in the right conditions so i you know my general answer is like it's actually a a part that still needs to be really researched and thought about um in in our experience at least because um you know the plywood is in a way also can be, or this thin, this thickness of plywood can also be very delicate. Um, and you don't really get like, we, I've never seen exterior pressure treated plywood at this thickness. I've only seen it for like kind of lumber elements um, that are meant to be sitting on the ground. So, you know, there's also that question of how, how that would get treated. Um, so yeah, it, it's an open question um, and it's an area for development still. Yeah, but I think typically what in part of your answer, most of the projects are installations that indeed are not made to have a very long lifespan, but there's parts of it that are doing, that carry a kind of research into, um, into shapes, into geometry, into their informed geometry, into the use of a digital fabrication that are, of course, then could form spin-offs to do other things. And I think there, it's an sich, the product itself, is, it's very it's it's beautiful of course what you've made and that's that's a, 
typical architectural approach and how you use this uh, complex technology with cheap materials into a new shape language. Yeah. Uh, even getting from what is fantastic that you're uh, weaving literally other um, other fields into your thinking and into your design process. Uh, typically, this patterning and to be fair, this this uh, magic patterning from um, um, from the Japanese author, something right. I have shown the last three years in my courses also. So it's really it's, it's a brilliant reference, of course. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> I, we love that book. And I think it's, it's it's fantastic also to see how it's possible to develop complex shapes and coming, um, I'm wearing a suit at the moment and how it's cut here, actually it builds very complex shapes around the human body already and has certain supporting points. And so there's a lot of similarities into the approach and it has beautiful drawings. So we could, one could uh, ask maybe two, shouldn't we change the way we're drawing plans for buildings also? More like pattern, uh, pattern things in, in fashion. So there's right. there's a lot of things there I, I believe that are of influence, especially in the fast digitizing era that that are really amazingly interesting. Yeah. I, I had one more question maybe is um, I'm wondering if you really like the robot or if you're we could also do without and explore more there because we've seen a lot of projects now with the robotics. And I don't think it's necessarily, I had a discussion yesterday evening with somebody that, yeah, it's, of course, it's nice to see, but it's how, how open is it to everybody if you're using the robotics? And is it not, and my answer was a little bit not very clear, but actually it's a lot more about exploring and how what you can do things and explore new shapes. I don't think it's a lot about the robotics. But on the other hand, of course, you're masters in using it. How important is it to you? I think for us, it's, I personally see it as a, you know, a six-axis machine because that's what it is. It's just, uh, it just, yeah, I, it just offers us the flexibility of more access, right? Like CNC would do the same work in many cases, for example, if we don't need that many axes. So it just gives us like this kind of like flexibility for fabrication. Um, it's it's something that um, we're very happy that we've been exposed to, but we, after graduating, we've realized how um, difficult, difficult it is to have access to it, right? And um, how it can uh, somehow limit what we can do if you want to work with it. So we try to find, you know, other ways to work around it and, and find different kinds of possibilities. Uh, it definitely offers possibilities and it opens different doors, but as every tool has this kind of like, you know, gives us a lot of possibilities, but also has specific limitations. So working with it, it also gonna bring limitations that if you don't have the robot, you can explore something else and explore something different. So I think that the, specifically when we talk about Timber, it can be, it's, it's one tool that is available right now. I think some years ago it like, reached the peak because it was just introduced in the architecture field and everyone was excited about it. Um, I think now, you know, more tools are coming into the game and uh, we see how AR and VR is tapping into that and even like, you know, creating more possibilities, creating even more like um, expanding kind of like all the all the design possibilities and, and fabrication possibilities that we have with this material, but it's not, it's it's one tool. For us, it's just, I just, that's how I feel. It's, it's a tool as it's all of the other tools that we have right now. It offers a lot of things. It limits us in other things. It's good to know it. It's out there now. All Most uh, architects that deal with digital fabrication right now are exposed to it. And I think it's important that we know how it works um, so that we know what is out there. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's just one of the many tools we have as yeah. architects. Yeah. I was going to add, like, I think also the part of the, um, the way our thoughts um, have evolved in terms of using the robot also, um, there's a part of us that um, we, we want sometimes the integration of that technology is to to showcase it and expose it to more people with the idea that we kind of demystify it more and more. I mean, it is quite demystified if you, you can learn a lot about it online. There's a, a lot of resources, but, you know, sometimes part of the integration of that is kind of the, that demystification for, for someone that might think that um you know it, it, it's difficult to use part of our the kind of um, pedagogical approach is to to integrate that into this um which um in the tab 
proposal was was kind of our thinking you know that it's not like this this thing that just arrives this complex thing that just arrives on the side and is assembled but that like you know a, a person that is not involved in construction or design can understand um how things these things are made and that they're readily accessible and their kind of potentials as a way to like open it up open up this field to more and more ideas and um and opinions i think there's another aspect which which you also highlight with your production is that the robots are specifically making prefabricated units yes and so for a smaller carbon footprint we we need to go more into prefabrication probably into units and it's in a and it's a totally in a customized customized pre prefabricated units that you can actually just simply assemble on site which means you have a more dry a drier construction technique on site that it's more precise and it still goes to any demands and i think there when i think back of some visits i had last year in uh, ch some chinese factories to to do some projects i was shocked almost to see how many of these robotics are already used uh in 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 their factories for doing uh building parts it's unbelievable i mean right. i saw in a regular workshop where normally you would have some welding people to to do some steel work for interior designs for stairs and all this i just saw four robots working together picking up pieces and welding stuff together in very complex shapes and it was all very normal for for people over there i i have to admit i mean i haven't been in a workshop in in, in europe where i have seen this and this scale also and this right. It's again going for these prefabricated solutions. So people, it's coming to the to these uh, to the manufacturers, I believe, at the moment, which might give us then the possibility again to do customized solutions and explore new ideas actually with them. And if we leave it up to them alone, it's not going to happen, of course. So right. thanks for 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 sharing this all. Uh, and and that is a small comment, like talking about this kind of like you know robotics in the field. I think I think it's important. Um, you know, a new tool came out, everyone was excited about it, uh, everyone started using it, and I think it's great, like, we've seen, like, great work coming out of that, and I think now it's time, kind of, like, to reflect on that, like, after this kind of, like, of excitement, like, it's, it's, I think it's good that we now, especially with what's happening in the world in the last year, I think it's good that we kind of, like, have a more holistic understanding of where this kind of like very niche field is a uh, big part of the world today and the larger picture of it, the impact that it has, you know, like social, political situation today, uh, climate change, like all of these things. I think um, it's it's really for, for, for us and for our practice, this kind of like zooming in and zooming out process, it's super important and interesting. And, you know, we zoom in, we see details, we see, you know, how an effector is working, but then at the same time, it's really important for us also to keep our motivation going, to zoom out and see, you know, what's the impact of that. And I think for students, um, it's, it's really motivating and important for them and for the world to understand, you know, what they're doing, what the meaning is, and, and what, what this impact is, and how it kind of like, um, yeah, is, how is part of kind of like a larger picture today. So I think that's something for every student to, um, you know, figure it out and take their own approach and their own path later, but always like try to think about, you know, as you're zooming in and research very specific things, always try like to zoom out and see what is this doing actually for, for the world today. <laughs> Uh, but this is because the question that came there from somebody from Sachin is indeed asking like, how did this ICD thing shape your, um, uh, shape you? And, and this is, I mean, it's unbelievable that the university in Stuttgart offered this chance also for people to get into this branch of explorative ways of uh, finding new shapes and testing new materials and all this. and. And there, I think this is specifically, but it comes back and we're going round and round in this thing, like, what is it that we can explore, of course, and what can we do to the students actually to to find their own way or to reflect on the future, because it's them that are going to have to do this. So it's an interesting question. So how did it shape you guys? Why, why did you go there in the first place, actually? Um, I think uh, it definitely <laughs> influenced a lot. Um, we're both architects. We come from a kind of like um, conventional architectural background. And for me, I think, I guess, 
for you maybe um, the same. We we just wanted to be exposed to something else, right? Like after five, six years of architectural education, you know, felt like um, we need to be exposed to something else and um, being interesting in technologies, being interesting in kind of like a more technical part that we were not exposed before in architectural studies was part of my specifically choice to go there. Uh, but I think it's also interesting to see, you know, um, you you get like an architectural uh, degree, uh, you, you get this kind of exposure to design architecture role, then you, you go into like a more niche and you figure out, um, you know, all this kind of like academic research work, which is like super fascinating, but then like you graduate and of course there are different paths, but um, for us, moving out of Germany, coming to the US, completely different system. Um, I work in academia, it's a completely different system in academia, also like this, field in the U.S. Is, a, is in a completely different state than it is in Europe and it works in a different way. Um, so I think being exposed to all of these things, it's got, kind of like reflects, I think, what we're trying to do in our practice that, you know, it's kind of like, you know, try to take bits and pieces of things that we are excited about from being exposed to all these different things and try to make sense out of it for us. Um, and developing projects that are kind of more, more personal and developing more of like our own language afterwards. But being exposed to all of these different things, different academic institutions, uh, different continents, different uh, different completely ways of thinking, it's it's super important. So like uh, I definitely like encourage students to you know don't be afraid to jump into something different, especially if it goes into like more technical things that maybe architects are afraid of. Um, it was it was super critical. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you. I mean, I'm really uh, I'm happy. So I think there's it's very nice things to see, very insightful for the students, very, uh, very nice for them to see your enthusiasm also, how to present it, how to explore things, and even do your practice based on this kind of stuff. I mean, coming out of university and still working on this kind of exploratory ways of uh, reinventing yourselves, guys, that's, that's really it's a nice message to take with us for tonight. For all, for all the listeners tonight. Um, so I hope to see you back, the two of you. I hope yes. to be able to get this discussion even further and uh, try out sure. some of the things that you've shown. And for the others, sure. we still have somebody tomorrow, the last speaker actually, it's I think it's at 12. So we have Gilles Retzen. I saved a, a fellow Belgian guy for the end. Uh, so it's, um, Great. Has, yeah, has, a, different, a different approach there too. Yeah, totally, totally. Uh, but a lot about modularity, right? I mean, again, there, prefabrication, but taking it to a total other level of prefabrication, much less engineered, that's, uh, that's for sure, uh, but nonetheless interesting and very different uh, uh, approach. So, um, happy to see you guys around again, and yes. then to the others. See you tomorrow, I hope. Have a nice evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Have fun with the workshop. That's the most important part. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Right. Bye-bye, guys.